Hello and welcome back. You're watching Keeping It Real. I'm David Grossman. I'm here with Eric Putnam from Debt Coach. Eric, how are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank Thanks for inviting us. Thank you very much. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, Eric. He's got uh, quite a background in everything from mortgages to uh, to debt and different things. Um, Eric is a managing director of Debt Coach Canada, the health club for your wallet. Sometimes I think I need more than a health club for my wallet, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, Eric leads a team of professionals which help Canadians coast to coast to resolve, uh, to resolve financial challenges and improve their credit profiles. Uh, prior to founding Debt Coach Canada in 2005, Eric was employed for 26 years in various management positions in the lending industry, acting as a director for underwriting at a national mortgage lender. Uh, he also served as one of the found, uh, founding directors of the Canadian Association and accredited mortgage professionals. Uh, he holds a diploma in personal financial uh, planning and insolvency counseling. Uh, and of course, the um, company uh, you can reach Debt Coach Canada, their um, uh, website is debtcoach.ca. Um, Eric, glad you could uh, join us. So, uh, you know, it was a good, I think, follow up to our, our, our discussion with Sean. Uh, the market has. The real estate market is growing, growing. I, I don't know who said it, but people have been treating their houses like a, like a bank machine. I, I don't remember whose who's quote that was. I'm not sure either. Uh, not sure, but um, I think to some extent it's true. What, what are you seeing out there now? Well, frankly, the number one thing that we've seen over the last number of years is the ability for people to use secured lines of credit. At one point, you could get up to a 90% loan to value a few years ago. Um, I live in Milton. The price of housing in my area went up between 5 and 8% compounded year over year since I bought there eight, uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, Milton's been a big growth area. Right, and basically the burbs around the GTA is pretty much similar. Um, but, um, you know, the government, as Sean just alluded to a few minutes ago, the Department of Finance has made some changes, and frankly, I think it's timely. I think people have to take more accountability for their own finances. Um, when they speak to financial advisors, traditional CFPs, if you will, and other financial advisors, I used to be a banker, my background there, um, we focus around asset accumulation, you know, the left-hand side of the balance sheet, whereas, frankly, there's a lot of debt going on, and um, the way I look at things and the way our team looks at things, it's how you look at your total financial picture and primarily your net worth. There's only two ways to do it. Either your assets go up mm -hmm. or your debts, if you will, liabilities come down. And it's your net worth at the end of the day that should really count. That and cash flow. Uh, we're just speaking off air before we get on. Yeah. People aren't getting raises like they were in the past. Uh, my own wife hasn't got a raise in three years. She's a manager with a major retail chain. And, um, you know, it's just the way it is. Right. So, well, I think it, also, it, it starts with the, with the cash flow, I would say, right? I mean, if people could, uh, you know, uh, cover all yeah. of their expenses... Uh, well, I should, that, that's not necessarily true. I guess people are borrowing money for things. Sometimes they're, they're good things, and sometimes Absolutely. they're not, not so good things. So, so uh, how, do you, how are you able to help people? I mean, should they be coming to you before they go to, the, uh, to, the, to visit the trustee or their mortgage broker? Well, actually, it's interesting you mention that because we get a lot of referrals from trustees, from other financial advisors, including mortgage brokers, credit unions. I've spoken at a few credit union conferences the last few years as a guest speaker. Um, frankly, what we try to do is, number one, get a spending plan down on paper and see what's going on. And so really, and it's really about budgeting to start well, with. Well, I like to use the, um, the three Bs that people are scared of in our lifespan. The first B is as a child, you're scared of the boogeyman. Right. The second B is when you get become an adult and you move out on your own is the word budget. That's true. The third B is bankruptcy. Right. Frankly, some people, that's what they have to do. It's the last option, if you will, on a long list of options. Um, traditionally, as a former banker, my job was to sell what the bank had on its shelf of products mm -hmm. and to maximize profitability for the bank. Right. Um, we look at it completely unbiased. Um, we're not selling any products of any kind, and truthfully, we're not necessarily working with that niche of the market, if you will, that the trustees and the credit counselors are. We're much more looking at the clients that are middle-income households that have cash flow Money coming in, the question is, where is it going out? And when we do a delimination plan for folks, which we have on our membership site, it's a, and frankly, it all starts with getting honest with yourself and having a good discussion. So I encourage your viewers, David, to visit our website and do a short little quiz we have online. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's at deckcoach.ca slash quiz. Uh, do it. They automatically get an email response back with their score. And then have their spouse or partner do, do one. And then okay. print it off. And then put them side by side on a table at the kitchen and see how they match up. Right. It was interesting when we used to ask people, after doing this for about 300 different people that went through the exercise, um, out of the average 25 questions that's on the quiz, 11 out of 25 were responded to similarly by the spouses, if you will, in the family. Right. 11 out of 25 when it comes to total financial picture, A to Z. Right. Um, until you get your kind of goals focused and you get commonality, if you will, between the two, two incomes coming into the household, Two incomes spending the, or two parents, if you will, spending the money. But what we see is the teenage kids, um, you know, frankly, there's a lot of teenagers spend more money going out of the parents' pockets than what the parents may be spending on variable expenses, sports, right. all of that stuff. Right. Yeah, I can see that becoming a big problem, too, is young people, they're going out and they're getting credit cards. I've, I've seen it firsthand and there's just no, the, just right now, no people, ability to pay. People are going to be going to college in the next couple of weeks, university, and I'm sure they're going to be given credit cards without even a job at age 18. Right. And uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I've come across some friends that have bailed out their kids because they finally, you know, kids coming to mom and dad and saying, I've did this. Right. Messed up my credit already. I'm 20 years old and I've got, you know, $10,000 racked up in credit card debts and they're working at a pizza place on Friday and Saturday nights. You know, and frankly, um, what they're thinking was, I'm not sure, but they didn't mm -hmm. even have a steady payday. Right. But yet they're able to get two, three, four credit cards. Right. And at age 19, 20, I mean, it's sad, you know, but it's happening out there. And, you know, we were chatting earlier that when you go to get a credit card, um, the banks traditionally have not asked for verifiable income. Mm-hmm. Um, yet, when you go to get a mortgage, every document, ha as you know, being in the business, everything has to be verified pretty much up and down now, unless you have a lot of equity Is in your home. Is that changing now? I personally haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, I found, I was speaking to a friend of mine that's working in a head office of one of the major banks, and he was informing me recently that for unsecured credit, they now require a credit score of a minimum of 700 for unsecured borrowing. Right. Um, that's a lot higher than CMHC requires for a traditional insured mortgage. But again, we're talking uninsured lending. So getting back to credit cards, um, it's like a drug. Once you're hooked, it's very difficult to get off of that. And frankly, uh, we often will come across people that have got a, quite a bit of debt. I'll just share quickly a scenario which you're dealing with right now with a mm -hmm. client. Sure. Um, husband was self-employed, had a business, uh, was related to the auto sector, he lost a major client. Uh, he was a subcontractor to one of the contractors to Chrysler. Uh, through the recession, he lost a major customer, had to shut down his business. Um, he's now back to work. He's now got a steady paying job, but he had to close his business. Right. Um, his wife has got a steady job. She's a senior manager with a national known name firm. Mm -hmm pulling in over $100,000 a year in her name. He's pulling in about 50000 in his name. But yet they haven't put any money aside for their kids' education, 14 and 8 years old. They've maxed out their house. They've refinanced the house three times over the last six, seven years. Right. Um, good people. Honest, hardworking people. But yet when they sat down with their financial advisor, the advisor is talking to them about their wealth management and their mutual funds and their insurance. They've collapsed their RSPs. These folks are in their mid-40s. They've collapsed their RSPs trying to keep his business afloat. Right. They've tapped so out. So they have no RSPs they have left. No, they have no equity in anything at this point. The cars are fully financed. The house is fully financed. And they've financed. got a lot of unsecured debt as well. Yeah. Well, not, not to the point where they need to go to a trustee or a credit counselor, in my opinion. Their okay. debt is up to date. We actually sent Is it them, very high interest rates? Or? Uh, no. Most of it is like unsecured. It's like 8%, 10% stuff. So it's so not... So you figure they can... They can be they, they can get out. things a little bit, exactly. they should be able to manage those payments. They can restructure, get their... Goals focused, right? And the number one goal for them was to, frankly, look at their kids. The kid is the oldest child is 14 years old. There is a Canada Educational Savings Grant available in our ESP, which they're not utilizing for the child. So what we looked at was look at all your goals. Number one goal for them was I want to do right by my children. We know that with only a grade 12 education, how far are they going to get? So right. we want to do that for them as much as we can. 
We want to get our 35-year remaining amortization mortgage paid down before we retire. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, 35 years, so it'll be 120, but anyhow. And lastly, um, get the credit card debt. So when they spoke to their bank, they were trying to get a consolidation loan. Sorry, can't be done. The gentleman's just back to work for a little, little less than a year. Right. No collateral. Cars are fully leveraged. Um, we looked at doing a consumer proposal or a credit counseling type program for them. They want to try to keep their credit rating good. They want to try to work a program that they can budget better, that they can keep focused. And one of our coaches is dealing with them every two weeks to keep everything focused so that hopefully at the time it moves forward over the next six months as we work with them, they'll be well down the path because they have the disposable income. It's just that it's mm -hmm. going in 18 different directions, if you will. Right. Knock down some of the priorities, get it really focused, and then let's move forward with a plan. Because typically a financial planner will simply say to them, you need to build your RSP, you need to do all these great things. And we're not saying don't do it, but why invest? And this is my point of view anyway, and I speak from experience myself. I had money invested in the markets over the last few years. It mm -hmm. dropped substantially. Right. And if you're borrowing money, even if it's at 8%, um, and you're getting a negative return on your investments or after tax you're getting next to nothing return, it doesn't make any sense to be trying to invest at the same time you're trying to pay down debt. Especially if you're, if you're paying very high uh, interest rates. Yes, and frankly, the, the, the big thing in Canada, and I did uh, share with you a slide, is the uh, percentage of disposable income that's being used to address consumer debt in Canada is higher now than it ever has been. It's, I believe it's 153% of disposable income reported by Stats Canada in June. Right. And just today, TransUnion, uh, which one of the major credit reporting agencies, reported in the Globe and Mail that um, on, uh, sorry, non-mortgage debt is now higher than it ever has been in the eight years that they've been tracking their statistics from their database with consumers. So that's telling something right there. We're not even talking mortgage debt. We're talking on non-mortgage debt in their statistic. So what's going to happen when interest rates go up? I mean... Um... Well, I'm in my mid-50s, and I got into the banking business back in the early 80s, and mm -hmm. I bought my first house in 83 at 17% for a one-year term, David. I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that we're going to go back to that double-digit interest rates, but based on Bank of Canada statistics that's on the Bank of Canada website, the average five-year mortgage rate over the last 30 years has been somewhere around 7.5%, I believe it is. Right. And um, I think, you know, over the next three to five years, it's a good question. What is the interest rate going to be? Are Canadians prepared for that bump, as Sean spoke to earlier? Um, even a 1% jump on a traditional mortgage in Toronto is quite a substantial hit to the average person's pocketbook. Right. Especially when their incomes aren't keeping pace. I, I, I don't know if you can comment on this. As a, as a mortgage broker, you know, we, we sometimes talk to people who are looking at uh, either bankruptcy or consumer proposal, um, what have you, and, and um, uh, you know, um, do people have a choice whether they can just go bankrupt or do a consumer proposal? I think there's a lot of misinformation out there with financial professionals of all cloths, whether it's a credit union, a mortgage broker, or CFP financial advisor. Um, in fact, in September, we're going to be hosting a webinar ourselves. Anybody wishes to um, reach out to us, you're welcome to contact you, and I'll be happy to share with you when it's available. But we're going to do an educational session specifically on this topic of the different solutions that are out there available mm -hmm. that when professionals are being asked by the consumer, what are my options? Frankly, the professionals don't even have the answers these days. Right. There's a lot of people talking about debt settlement, and there's a lot of people talking about credit counseling. Um, I could do a 30-minute discussion just on this one topic, but the short strokes is, is that they need to be informed, mm -hmm. and they need to do their homework. Um, too many people reach out to the first solution that they see advertised online or on whatever media, and it seems like because of the stress that they're dealing with, they take the first solution that seems to be that particular solution. But I'm sitting here telling you that I know trustees that have taken people, put them into consumer proposals, and something changed in six months, a year. The wife gets pregnant. Uh, the part-time job disappears. They no longer can afford the consumer proposal. Right. They were trying to keep the home. They were mm -hmm. trying to do all the right things. But life gets in the way. 
of a yeah, plan. Right. And that plan has to be somewhat in flux. You have to be able to deal with it. When they go into a credit counseling program, and as we discussed on the phone recently, it has the exact same impact as if somebody did a bankruptcy. When they go to a mortgage broker or a mortgage professional at the bank or what have you, it doesn't change the reality that they owe money. Mm -hmm. But okay. um, I'm going to sit here and tell you honestly that our opinion is this is the challenge in the industry overall is that a credit counseling agency's got one product to sell you. It's called a debt management plan. A trustee's got two products to sell you. It's called a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy. For those uh, listening in, uh, the laws changed in 2009. Uh, I was interviewed um, at that time about the specific topic. How was it going to affect the you know, mortgage industry, if you will? And uh, it's much more onerous now for consumers to follow bankruptcy. Uh, if you don't try to do a consumer proposal through a licensed trustee, that's the only ones that can do it through, um, you can be held in your uh, estate longer. Mm -hmm. The courts do have ways of making it tough. And uh, frankly, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Right. And even the media, I've been interviewed by people in the media, Toronto Star Financial Post, on credit bureaus and, and dealing with debt and so on. I was uh, uh, recently asked to participate to provide some research for a book called Crushing Debt by David Traher, who's a CA here in right, Toronto. Right, which is this book here. Yeah, and uh, the long and the short of it is, David actually traveled to the U.S., saw what was happening in the U.S. with housing and the debt crisis, and he's trying to put a Canadian spin on it. And um, in his opinion, people have to step back and look at more than just numbers. When you're dealing with debt, it's more than just numbers. It's right. also the emotions. It's also your family situation. You have to look at it from um, a total picture. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of ourselves more of a liability advisor than anything. Right. And um, the last well, frankly, the last four years since the bubble really burst when it came to the mortgage industry. At one point, there was 15 mortgage lenders in Canada that were doing non-prime lending that are no longer existing today. Right. And um, it's sad. Well, um, Eric, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for joining us and for coming on the show. A lot of interesting information. If you're in this situation, you need help navigating these uh, these uh, waters that can be very challenging and difficult, make sure you go to debtcoach.ca. That is the website. We've got their uh, information on the screen for you as well. So uh, check them out if you need help. And uh, Eric, thanks so much. And I uh, hope we'll have you on again um, sometime soon. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Until next time, thanks so much for watching. I'm David Grossman. This is Keeping It Real. See you next time.